Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Phoenix, Arizona, it's time for Phoenix Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Welcome, everyone, to Project Management Office Hours, the number one live project management radio show in the United States, broadcasting to you today from Phoenix Business Radio X studios in Tempe, Arizona. I'm your host, Joe Puzz, PMO Joe. And for the next hour, we're going to be talking Agile again, just like we did on our last show. I'm so very excited for that. I want to thank our sponsors, the PMO Squad. Are you tired of failed projects? Deploy the squad to rescue your PMO and your projects. Start recovering lost time, money, and peace of mind. Visit www.thepmosquad.com to learn more about all of their project management services. Before we get into our discussion today with our guests, I wanted to take a moment and talk about supporting veterans. If you're a regular listener to the show, you know that we are big supporters of veterans and veteran services. And I just wanted to mention, as I have on prior shows, that I'm running the Marine Corps Marathon on October 28th. So we're less than two months away. And along with training for that race, I'm also raising funds to support the charity Team Red, White, and Blue. As of today, thanks to the donations I've received from uh, so many near and far family and friends across the U.S., I'm actually number one in the nation for the amounts of funds that have been raised for that race. But I know who's in second, third, and fourth, and they're going to want to try to top me. So I'm reaching out to my audience today to try to get your support and make a donation to help support our veterans. Once again, that's Team Red, White, and Blue is the charity, and you can visit www.pmojoe.com and there's a link to Team Red, White, and Blue where you can make your donation and also on the PMO Squad webpage under the radio section, uh, there's links to that. So cheer me on October 28th. Hope I survive and we'll see how it goes. 26.2 miles is going to be fun. Also a reminder to everybody who is listening, uh, we are live radio and you can tweet in questions for myself or the guest today. Use hashtag PMO Joe, and we will make sure that we can get your question over to Dmitry Panamarov. Did I say that right? It's uh, you, you said it the, Rus- the Russian accent way, so I liked it. Okay. <laughs> Dmitry is our guest today. Thank you so much for being on. Dmitry, can you share with the listeners a little bit about yourself? Yeah, so um, I've been in uh, Arizona for uh, close to 15 years coaching organizations of various size, mostly the large ones, and doing um, a lot of great things with Agile and more recently more towards the lean uh, thinking and Kanban. So just, you know, an Agile company here in the Valley that just um, loves helping organization get uh, more Agile and more lean. And everyone I talk to locally uh, about Agile, because that's not necessarily a strong suit of ours, the PMO squad, everybody knows who you are. So you're, you're, Possibly, I guess, the go-to guy in the valley for agile services. Yes, it comes. It comes with uh, refusing to travel. Uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it's something I did early in my career, but then realized was not my thing. And so, yeah, my competitors don't really like the, this market because they keep running into um, my team of local agile coaches, and we enjoy developing these relationships here in the in the valley. And for those listening, you probably noticed we started the show a little bit late today. We were having some technical challenges connecting with our other guest who was scheduled to be on. Unfortunately, we're going to have to get her rescheduled. But Laura Barnard was going to be joining us from Washington, D.C. Laura is the founder of PMO Strategies and Project Management for Change, which is a nonprofit. She's been helping business leaders get results they crave using the power of project management for the last 24 years. 15 of those years, she was a PMO leader inside organizations and the last five helping them as a consultant. And she really wanted to make sure everybody was aware that she has her upcoming PMO Impact Summit, which is coming up next week and will run for a couple of weeks. I'm very fortunate to have been asked to present during that summit. So on, I believe it's Wednesday the 12th, you'll be able to catch my presentation. It is free for all to join the conference. And then there are options of different scale that you can get if you want to get a paid uh, admission to the conference. So please check out PMO Impact Summit. 
and you will be able to get more information about that. And Laura, sorry we couldn't get connected today, but we will get you back on the show as quickly as we can. So we're going to focus today with Dimitri. In our last show, we had Jeremy Wood from Matrix Resources on, and Jeremy was a mat- uh, is an Agile coach as well. And we got tremendous feedback and insight from that show. So we wanted to stay with the Agile theme because it is so popular today in our industry, and we wanted to bring in one of our local experts. So Dimitri is here with us, and, and thank you for that. Let's talk a little bit about Kanban, because when we had Jeremy on last week, we really didn't dig into the intricacies of Kanban. Can you share with us what is it, what makes it different, what's powerful about it, all the juicy details that make it uh, so important in your life? Yeah, sounds good. I mean, Kanban, which comes from uh, lean thinking and, and the fastest way to explain it comes from this Toyota mindset of using it in lean manufacturing it existed way before Agile. Agile is around 15 years old, but Lean Thinking and Kanban have been out there since uh, 1950s. And what's interesting is the beauty of Agile, and this is why a lot of people felt that maybe they would weather the storm of Agile and it would just a flavor of the month, but Agile is sticking around because as soon as you meet the values and principle of Agile, you are considered an Agile methodology. And so Kanban got scooped in as an agile methodology, strictly because the principles and and the values behind this technique fits perfectly with agile from a mindset perspective. So, what makes Kanban different? Well, the first thing is it is a um, process driven approach, which means that you usually um, identify a process and map it on a Kanban board using Kanban cards, and you flow them uh, as efficiently as you can through this board. Uh, the reason I think it's an important topic today is in the last three years, what we've discovered is that everyone wants to do agile, but a lot of leaders in a lot of organization confuse the word agile with the word scrum as if they were synonyms. And they are not synonyms. Um, agile is purely a philosophy and a mindset where scrum is one of many methodologies under the agile umbrella. Others, uh, well known are extreme programming, but then Kanban came in as kind of a weird cousin and, uh, what it did is it um, opened up the mind to say, does everything need to be iterative? And one thing that is the big difference between Kanban and Scrum is there's no concept of time boxing in Kanban. So most other agile techniques uh, are iterative by having sprints in Scrum or iterations in extreme programming. But Kanban comes at it as a continuous flow and embraces all the other uh, lean mindset technique as continuous improvement, Kaizen, and then measuring and managing the flow and ultimately, um, being fanatic about fine-tuning your process in almost everything that you do as a team or as an organization around Kanban. So it's five simple properties. And the reason I think it's working well uh, lately in the Agile space is moving from waterfall to Scrum is very disruptive. Moving from waterfall to Kanban, a lot of um, organizations make fun of me, but The Kanban board is very Kanban, but then the column names are very waterfall. And so what happens is it's actually a very smooth transition because it's not disruptive. It's pretty much starting with what you know, which is one of the principal in Kanban, and mapping it and visualizing on the board. And I'll leave you with my first of two guarantees as a coach is if you visualize your work and every day you walk in and you look at it, I guarantee increased productivity. And so one of the five properties in Kanban is just visualizing your work. So... I'll share more as we as we talk, but from a, a high level perspective, I mean, it is one of the agile methodologies, and I believe that um, especially now that the third wave of agile, which we started with doing agile teams fifteen years ago, the last ten years was mostly about scaling agile across the organization, but the third wave uh, has been referred to as business agility, and when you start seeing the benefits of agile across your organization, and you're a marketing department or a finance department, you want to be agile too. But you can't do Scrum or extreme programming, which is only for software. So Kanban fits that space where you can actually be agile too, but using a different technique that is much less overhead, much less roles, much less artifacts, etc. So this is why I believe Kanban is taking a a nice bite out of the market lately is the business sales organization want to be agile too, and we can't tell them no anymore. We have to help them. And also some of the early um, Scrum and Agile teams are seeing some uh, benefits in terms of maturing towards a Kanban technique. Yeah, you touched on something there about non-IT related, right? I'm thinking back many years ago, 
to my days working with Textron and visited the EasyGo golf car manufacturing floor. And on the floor were Kanban boards all over the place where they were putting together the golf cars. So as they moved from station to station and also up at the front of the factory were these boards that back then as a young guy, I had no idea what I was looking at. But it, its purpose and its usefulness exceeds beyond IT departments where traditional thinking of Agile exists today. And I think that to your point of this third wave of Agile and the agility through the organization, that you're taking these principles and bringing them to non-IT functions to help them. And Kanban seems to be a perfect fit. And it's not really new there, right? It's been around in those other, uh, with Toyota and other manufacturing for a long time. Yeah, so for a good example, recently with one of our customers, their legal department, imagine that, they wanted to be agile too. And uh, for us, that was an interesting challenge because everyone was complaining about legal, (laughs) (laughs) which means that everyone was trying to do things across the organization, but legal had to play their role of making sure it was legal, (laughs) everything they did. So what was interesting is they decided to uh, solve the problem by actually joining forces and becoming agile too. And obviously with them, we we took a bunch of lawyers in a room and we did an exercise to build and visualize what it would look for legal to flow their work on a board. And within an hour, we were able to, and I, I keep reinforcing with lawyers, to actually build a very effective board that they're using now. And there's no more excuses. I mean, if the organization wants to be faster time to market, it's an organizational need to fulfill. It's not just a software team or just isolated pockets. Everyone has to chip in and, and be agile to a certain state. So we've talked a little bit here about boards, right? So listeners trying to paint that picture, what's the visual of a board, right? Because if you never used it, a board maybe looks like a chalkboard or a whiteboard or what is it? How do you construct a board, right? What are the, you mentioned different columns. What does it look like first? Paint that picture for us. Yeah. So anytime we do a Kanban workshop, we always start with the same board, which has three columns to do in process, and done. So any Kanban team should start with this basic uh, three-column board. What's important is what we call the in-process or WIP column, which stands for work in process. So the to-do and done can be anything you want in terms of of number of cards, but the WIP columns, which is everything in in between, is for you to express in your own terms. So the way we go about it is you start with one column called in progress, and then you pretty much trash it and replace it with English verbs. So in a typical um, software development, the verbs that we would see replacing for web columns are typically analyze, design, develop, test, deploy. We just did a board for a governance team at um, at uh, an energy company last week, and they literally said, Dimitri, can we just map <laughs> the PMI <laughs> steps on your board? And I'm like, it's your board, not mine. And so if you believe that you're following this process and this process works for you, then you just discovered the columns of your board. So to answer your question, it always starts with a basic board of to-do, which is your backlog, Mm -hmm. in progress, which will be exploded to represent the actual flow of your work, and then a done column. And so whatever you believe um, should be in the middle of these to-do and done column is what becomes your board. And that's what we do in the workshop is we spend in under an hour we work with the team to figure out what is the ideal process for them to flow their cards. And what's the purpose of done? Because if you're done, why do we need to show that on a board? It's, is it maybe to track how much work we've accomplished? Yeah, so the done column plays um, an important role when it comes to metrics. So the whole concept, uh, so one of the, the other pro- five properties in Kanban is to measure and manage the flow. And one of the way to measure the flow is to count how many cards make it into the done column on a certain frequency, whether it's weekly or monthly. Um, So the idea is that you do want to count your cards in the done column, which will turn to be your throughput, which will start declaring the capacity of the team. And this is where we do the connection back to manufacturing. Uh, Sometimes teams don't like when I call them factories because that sounds very manufacturing. But really, when you declare yourself as a Kanban team, you are literally a small factory And you have to respect the number of people on your team, their abilities, and therefore you need to declare how many cards can your factory deliver on a weekly basis in the done column. So the first purpose is definitely to measure your flow in terms of how many cards can hit the done column on a certain frequency. But the second one is in Agile, and this is why Kanban, Lean, and Agile are all friends, is we believe in happy people 
and yeah. celebration. And so for us, your cards should remain in the done column, even for a little bit of time, so that we can at least observe and celebrate our success. So that's one of the more fun reason to have that done column. All right. So we've got the columns. All makes sense. Is it actually a physical board? In today's advanced technology world, I'm imagining there are software solutions for Kanban boards as well. Yes. So for us, we love to um, make people suffer first um, <laughs> because that's usually how you learn the fastest. And also, it's very um, important for you to learn from flowing a few cards because your board will keep evolving. So this is the other another property in Kanban called um, improving collaboratively or the spirit of Kaizen is that we hope that after we build your first board, that as you flow real work on it, that you will discover maybe columns you didn't think about or better ways of, of constructs, constructing your board. But when it comes to physical versus electronic, we like people to start physical. The workshop works very well like this. And then once they think they've settled, then they can move electronically. There's two reasons to go electronic. The first one is metrics. You can do it on a physical board, but it's very time consuming. Um, electronic tools will give you that out of the box. And the second one is if you're distributed. Obviously, if you're distributed, you're going to want an electronic version. So what me and uh, one of the coaches that has been working with me for 10 years have done um, this year is we actually, because we have so much demand for these distributed teams, we've actually built Kanban Zone, which is an electronic version of Kanban. And we actually use it now in training and in coaching where we can literally build your board and your workshop and convert your entire organization using electronic boards. So I think one of the probably most popular tools out there would be like a Jira, right? That, that's very board-driven mentality. Kanbanzone.com, I'm assuming, would be like a competitor to a type of Jira. And your uh, it's just... A Kanban board, whereas Jira is a whole bunch of other things in there. Correct. So Jira would fall under the um, ALM, Application Lifecycle Management Tools, where they manage the entire lifecycle. And to be to be completely fair, Jira is a great tool, but it, it stemmed from issue tracking, which they do very, very well. The beauty of Jira is it's extremely customizable. To your point, you can do pretty much anything you want with Jira. Now, what we've done is we've um, focused on just the need of having... Um, simple but powerful Kanban boards. And so here's the challenge that we ran into is we kept on using Jira and other products out there, but they can never create... Remember, we started... Start with a physical board. The problem with the physical board is it's just painter's tape and stickies on a wall and they can become really interesting. Yeah. And when you try to convert them to an electronic tool, they can't handle them because m most, if not all these tools out there are grids. Imagine mm. a tic-tac-toe. Yeah. They believe that a Kanban board should be a perfect grid, which... Sometimes works, but what we've discovered with our customers is the entire idea of building your board is building a board that works for you, and it not always resembles a perfect grid. So what we've done is we've definitely built um, the ability to build any board you can imagine, and we then invest in connecting these boards. So we are not competing on the ALM side. That is a much bigger landscape, and we definitely recommend tools like Jira and other ones out there for some of our customers. But when it comes to building and focusing on Kanban boards and connecting them across your organization, that this is where Kanban Zone is starting to find a, a very nice sweet spot to help these organization, in fact, uh, replace some of these tools with Kanban Zone. So as a PMO expert and project management expert, we go in and oftentimes we find organizations struggle with prioritizing their workload. And we work with clients who want to be agile as well, but we're certainly, that's not our specialty, right? We're not an agile shop. So if I'm working with them and I want to send them over to, to you guys, do you have Kanban zone capability to do prioritization as well? Yes. So, so the beauty is that Kanban zone comes with a lot of templates. Um, anytime we can create a template or a customer request a, um, a, a new board from us, we um, keep adding to our list. One of the templates around prioritization, uh, I don't know if you're familiar, but in Agile, we like using this Moscow technique. If you remove the O's from the word Moscow, you're left with M for must, S for should, C for could, and W for won't. And what we've done is we've mapped our columns on our Kanban board that when, when you have a column where you need to have um, very strong prioritization, we've split the column into four sub-columns called must, should, could, won't. And the Moscow technique is meant to be simple. 
And it's meant to fight against those wonderful um, um, people who believe that everything is a priority one and that everything must be a must. And so we try to trick him a little bit with the Moscow technique. But to tell you the truth, in a Kanban board, whatever, wherever your card is at the top of a column is your highest priority. Whatever is at the bottom of your column is your lowest priority. The reason I state that is for 15 years of coaching in organization, I still don't understand why I can't get everyone to understand there can only be one, 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 two, and one, three. This 10 ones and 50 twos <laughs> does not work. And we can play around the A ones, A twos, A threes. Bottom line, in Agile, it is a backlog that is prioritized. Whether it's on a Kanban board or in a sprint backlog, it is only one priority at the top, second, third. But I do like using Moscow to break that, um, that behavior. And I'm not familiar with Moscow, so that's new to me. So thanks for introducing it to me and our audience. It seems similar to Kano. I don't know if you're familiar with Kano analysis as well, where you're doing a similar must-do, delighter, right? One of those sorts of rankings as well. Yeah, Kano is very big on the marketing and making customers happy. So the the delighters, like you're talking about. So mm -hmm. when you translate from Japanese, those words, they're, they're very great words, but it's it resembles very much. It's just breaking this tie. I mean, if everything is a, is a must, then nothing's a must. And that's what yeah. we need to get through. Yeah, we, we struggle with our clients as well, teaching them that you can only have one number one, right? That's why it's number one. Okay, okay then it'll be 1A. And it's like, no, you can't do 1A or 1B, right? It's just one. Let's focus on priority. So is there a concept of like portfolio Kanban, right? Is there, what are some different concepts within Kanban? So this is one of the hottest topic right now in the Kanban community is it's fantastic to have one Kanban board and one Kanban team. But what happens if you have multiple teams or you're trying to track your work across the organization? For me, the most important thing to do in organization is have full traceability. So when we talk about portfolio Kanban, what we mean is there should be one, ball, one board to rule them all. And for me, that's what I call the C-suite or strategy board where you would see the initiatives or the goals of the organization. And we do put our C-suite customers on the on a Kanban board because they need to visualize what they're doing across the organization. And so the portfolio Kanban stems from a board that manages at the highest level your strategies. Each strategy card has what we call children cards, which are on lower boards. And we like to call the next level of board discovery boards. So the first level should be your cards that answer the question why, which in my book is the most important answer to, to answer first is why are we even doing this? Those should be initiatives that are uh, approved and understood at the highest level of the organization. And this is where you would see some ROI and some business case and really some justifications of why are we even doing this work? The next level of board is to focus on breaking this why into what. And this is where we've seen um, discovery teams made up of architects or product managers or subject matter experts really tying the why cards to what cards, which in the Agile space, sometimes we refer to as features or epics. But what it does is it gives you alignment. We shouldn't be working on a feature unless it ties to a real initiative. And then the last level, and there could be more levels, but to simplify it would be your team boards. So imagine a three-level portfolio. Your strategies are at the top and the cards are initiatives. The next level are discovery board where there could be features, modules, or epics that are tied to these initiatives. And then below these cards would be the teams who come in every morning and just look at what's in their backlog. And they would be working off of what we would deem as stories, enhancements, defects, or issues that stem again from the discovery board. So it's a complete traceability. And this is where Portfolio Kanban really helps because when we talk about faster time to market, most of your issues are not downstreams. Making your developers type faster on their keyboard is not really where you're going to get the most productivity gain. Mm -hmm. This is what we call cycle time, which is another metric in Kanban, is how fast can a team take a card from the done to-do column to the done column? And that's what we call cycle time. Usually in our coaching, we can always find a little bit of improvement. You can always improve anything. But at the team level, if you've got good people and they're doing their job the best they can, they're fine. Most of your issue are what we call in lead time, which is everything happening before the cards actually show up in front of your team. And so this is where, and we call it upstream, this is where most of your inefficiency are. Imagine this, this saying, and we have it all the time, the poor team receives a card and we ask, so 
When do you need it? Well, yesterday. When did you know about it? Well, six months ago, but I'm deciding to surprise you today with this one. Um, that's the kind of behavior we need to stop. Most of these requests were known for months, but they took forever to make it to the Kanban teams. So the more we can connect initiatives to features, features to stories, and have that connection across the boards using Kanban boards, the faster we can make sure that we're working on the right work, which is the first thing to solve in any agile organization, is are you right working on the right work? And then we need to make sure that as we flow these cards, that we pay attention to these metrics because I'm telling you, most of the issues is we talk and talk and talk about something great and months go by and then the date doesn't change. And that poor team is stuck having to deliver something in record time where we could have done a better job upstream. Yeah. And again, today we, we were going to be having guest Laura Bernard on with us. And Laura has put together the PMO Impact Summit, which you can get more information at PMOImpactSummit.com. And my presentation in that summit is tied to, to improve project management, you really need to fix your plumbing. It isn't the actual delivery of the project usually where your problem comes in. It's the upstream that you just talked about. It's the connection to strategy, prioritizing the work to ensure we're working on the right work at the right time with the right re- resources. And obviously, you can go out to the Impact Summit to get the full presentation. I don't want to give it all away here. But to see the parallels between traditional project management and Kanban, it it lies within the organization. We can go to any technique we truly want. But if the organization hasn't bought into whatever it is that we're going to do, you're not going to get results just because we switched from traditional to agile slash Kanban, right? Correct. And and I love what you're putting on the table because... Forbes has been doing a series of articles in, about Agile in the last few weeks. And, and really, it always boils down to these weird conversation of, I'm Waterfall, I'm Scrum, I'm Kanban. What you just said is the key is we need to just figure out what works best for us. In my book, all these techniques are tools around my tool belt. And based on the culture of the organization, based on the organizational structure, based sometimes on the leadership styles... We need to find what will work best. And the only thing I always tell organization is don't Frankenstein it. And what I mean by it is don't mix things that just are not meant to be mixed to each other. Waterfall is beautiful when you do it properly. Agile and its methodologies like Scrum and Kanban work great again when you don't bastardize them by trying to mix them with other things. I could care less in the end which methodology you use as long as it's a good fit and ultimately, we track this upstream and downstream, and we look for how to build efficiencies. So I agree with you, and this is why I, 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 I love this conversation, is I'm not tied on, on, on being a purist, on being agile or not. I just want to find whatever makes the customer <laughs> more effective. And sometimes it can be a combination as long as you don't mix them. And I'm with you. It's the, the tools in your toolkit, right? Yes. As many tools as you can bring makes you a more attractive consultant to go in and help organizations because guess what? Not all organizations are the same. They're all unique. So if you come in with a cookie cutter approach, you're probably not going to be their solution. Absolutely. And we have to look at the maturity. I mean, sometimes when we come in, there's people that are very good and they're not, um, and it's, it's our favorite expression is when we do an agile transformation, it's from the good the book Good to Great. For us, great organization, I'll summarize the book, maybe give it away for everyone, but it's the only difference between a good and great company is levels of trust. Once trust is high, suddenly these companies start flowing work efficiently and everyone's happy. And so for me, when you find the way to build your trust levels, and for us in Agile, it's called transparency. Usually trust goes high when transparency starts becoming a real thing where you show on your boards or you report on a iterative basis, how things are going and sometimes they're not going well, but in the spirit of transparency, you just give a sense of, hey, you've asked me to do something. It didn't work out the way I thought. And here's the results. And we want to build that transparency to build those, those trust levels. And ultimately, whatever uh, works best for organization, but you have to respect their maturity levels. Sometimes there's reasons why they're doing certain techniques and not others. So, We've talked a little bit in, around the, the edges of transforming from one technique to another. And usually when you make that transformation, it's because you're seeking more efficiency or effectiveness. What, what have you seen on the effectiveness of the actual transformations? What are challenges that organizations run into? 
what are the pitfalls they run into? What, what should they be thinking about when they want to change their techniques and their t- uh, strategies? Yeah, so on this one, um, I'm going to um, say something that for more ag- agile purists they're going to hate, but for me, the, trans- the agile transformation is a project. And when it's not tackled as a project, then it doesn't get the support or the visibility that is needed to actually make it happen. And when I say project, it doesn't have to be done in waterfall, but it needs to be con- considered as something that is going to impact a lot of people. So the first thing I want to put on the table is you cannot transform if you don't do a pilot first. And this is where a lot of companies keep making this mistake. You don't just hire someone to come and transform your organization. You must do a pilot in a in an environment where you get data points to understand where are your pitfalls. And they're different for every organization, but I'll share the most common one in a second. And the idea of the pilot is it's usually between two or three months which gives time for a few teams to, 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 to get a chance to experiment this new technique, but most importantly, to uncover these organizational impediments. Here's the challenge with doing an agile transformation. Most leaders understand this. Agile is not a silver bullet. You don't call yourself agile and suddenly it solves problems. It's actually more complicated than that. Yeah. You can call yourself agile, but you actually have to do a lot of things. And when you start doing them, agile actually exposes all the inefficiencies that you always had but refuse to tackle because you were able to hide them behind your current process. In Agile, because we make everything so transparent, we tend to expose these inefficiencies and say, it's time to fix them. And so we got to be careful. If you don't conduct a pilot, you should not be allowed to scale. Because if you scale without having data points from your pilot, it means that all the inefficiencies that you know about and you're not fixing are going to be exp- are going to be a compound effect when you start scaling this thing. So here are the most common pitfall we fall. And the first one is going to be surprising, but it is facilities. One of the things that we are noticing when we do these agile transformation, one of the principles in agile is to be co-located. Now, not taking it to literally is, of course, I will always say that a co-located team, people working in the same room, will always be a better scenario. Now, you can ask me how many times that has happened to me in my career. Not very often. But when it does, it's it's beautiful. The challenge is, is that we are ready to roll out these teams and then we hit facilities. And facilities are not ready. And it starts with not having whiteboards. Then having horrible cubes where communication and creativity is dead out of the gate because you can't even see other humans. So facilities tends to be a very strange one for us in terms of one of the impediments right out of the gate. The other one is refusing to train your leaders. So for us, when we do an agile transformation, we always start with a leadership training. And the reason for that is that the number one offender to the agile transformation are the leaders themselves. And we can't fault them. They have been successful for maybe 20 years using another technique. And now we're introducing something completely different. And the challenge with those darn leaders is they were successful before agile. And now that we're agile and asking them to behave on a human level differently, as soon as something goes wrong and it doesn't feel good, what do humans do? They go back to their comfort zone and they start pulling from their old technique. So, and I say this openly to all leaders, they are going to be our biggest trouble. So facilities, (laughs) leaders, and then it boils down to a lot of, if it's in a software space, a lot of engineering uh, practices. So the challenge with doing agile is that Yes, it will help you be faster time to market. It will increase collabor- collaboration and do a lot of very positive things, but it will cause a few consequences. For example, you can no longer perform with doing manual testing. You have to move to automated testing. You can no longer uh, re- re- rely on one team to deploy all your code because you're going to want to deploy your code more often, which means you again have to invest into automation or Continuous delivery, which is that whole DevOps topic. And mm-hmm. let me be very clear on this one. DevOps is a consequence of being agile. So the reason the word DevOps is so popular recently is because there's so many companies that have gone agile. Yeah. They can't continue to deploy once a month. They have to deploy more often. So the three big ones are facilities, leaders, and automation. So how about what I've seen, and certainly not with the depth or breadth that you have, is that parts of an organization will be agile and their integration to other parts of the organization aren't agile. So perhaps it's the data warehouse team is not agile, but the e-commerce team is agile. And 
there's an integration point there. So they're trying to go through a sprint cycle or a Kanban cycle to be able to put out new features. But there's a hindrance to the slower moving, or at least perceived to be slower moving, waterfall team that they rely on. How do you work with those intricacies? So this is a good one because here's the thing. The, the synonym to the word agile is adaptive. So when, when I get this question, I always answer it this way. Don't expect the waterfall people to be adaptive. That is not who they are and we don't expect them to be. So stop crying that they're not nice to you because they're doing waterfall. They are doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. So they need their requirements, they need their time to do their design, and then they need to... That's okay. If you're going to remain doing waterfall in some pocket of organization, embrace it and respect that it works that way. The teams that need to adapt are the agile teams. If you're going to have agile teams working with waterfall teams, then the agile team needs to adjust what they pull from their backlog and organize their sprints or iteration around the constraints brought from the waterfall teams. So it's simple. You, you, you bring in an initiative or a project and the, the waterfall team will tell you, well, I can't get to it until three months. If that's true and you can't do anything about it, then go work on other things in your backlog or practice scaffolding where you can work to a certain point without having the other interface in place by building a scaffold and using mock data and mocked interface, which are not real, but just to mimic what's going to happen because those waterfall people um, are spending so much time in design, they should know what it's going to look like at the end. So you build scaffolding. And once the waterfall team completes their work, which is usually too late for the agile team, you remove your scaffolding and hopefully <laughs> everything <laughs> <Yeah>. works. <laughs> yes, hopefully there's some good testing along the way, right? Correct, correct. So it's not it's not a bad problem. It's just you got to respect each methodology. They were built for a reason and agile teams are meant to adapt. So they need to find a way to respect what's coming from their other um, teams. And it's not a problem as long as we communicate. Maybe a similar answer and something that I have seen not as frequently as the last scenario, but two teams that are agile but have different sprint cycles and different methodologies of how they're agile, even within the same organization. Is it the same thing? Who who becomes adaptive in that case? Do both of them? Is there a primary adaptive? Uh, what have you seen with that scenario? So so this this is this is this is a fun one. This is a dream for most organizations that do agile. They state, "Let's do everyone on the same sprint cycle," which would mean that if you had, let's just be nice and just say ten teams, they would all start and start and end their cycle on exactly the same day, which sounds great on paper because that would simplify everything, except. Problem number one, facilities. How many rooms do you have for these 10 teams to go in a room and do their planning session and to actually collaborate? Well, you don't have enough rooms. Second, can you even handle deploying 10 teams code at the same time? So the challenge with this concept of, do we align all our teams on the same sprint schedule? I have heard this dream in almost every organization and I can't fault it. I think it's a great idea, except it does not work. So what we've seen more is staggering teams, which in my mind gives you even more productivity when you stagger your team on opposite weeks, for example. It gives the opportunity for your uh, product or business side to not have to wait two weeks because now your teams are staggered on opposite weeks, for example. We believe that once you invest into your automation, it doesn't really matter if you're on the same sprint cycle. So I'm not saying we don't attempt to do it. When it makes sense, we will do it for two or three teams to be on the same cycle. But putting everyone on the same cycle, in my mind, is just not possible. And I don't believe it brings the, the, the benefits that are expected on paper. So we've covered a lot of ground on Agile and, and specifically Kanban today. And, and you've talked a little bit about the life cycle of Agile and, and where it's now into this third wave. What's next, right? What's the fourth wave? What, what, for those people that aren't really in Agile today... Right. We look to you experts to kind of give us a glimpse of the future. What does that look like? So I'll, I'll share with you a story. I do a lot of speaking and it's happened to me now twice that five minutes before I get on a stand to talk about Agile, uh, because that's my, my, my talk, some leader or some attendants come to me and says, oh, by the way, good luck with your presentation. I just read an article that says Agile is dead. So have fun with your presentation. <laughs> I've taken up this with, um, with a different approach. I believe that Agile is going to be called the way we work. What I'm trying to say is that there's two problems with Agile. One, 
everything that comes out now, including Kanban, that sounds good, well, Agile is going to call it Agile. So everything is Agile. Right. <laughs> if it follows the values and principle of Agile, which are common sense statements. The reason I say Agile is not, the, I don't know that there's a fourth way. I believe it's going to be called the way you work. I've been doing a lot of Agile coaching with very young people. I've, I've, I've actually um, been asked to, um, to provide Agile training for um, uh, young teenagers at risk and also in universities and colleges. And what's interesting is that they're being taught Agile as if it's not interesting to call it anything. It's just called the way you work when you hit yeah. <laughs> employment later. And so the reason I'm putting that on the table is I believe waterfall, by the way, I don't think most people use the word waterfall until Agile came around. I think they just called it project management. It was sure. just called the way you did work. Yeah. Um, what has changed is in the last 20 years, the whole world has shifted from the industrial revolution where you build houses and cars to the knowledge revolution where we're building software. I mean, looking around us, I mean, even this radio show, we had to do everything through the internet using software. If you try to open a bank account today, the first thing they're going to do is they're going to bring you in an office and show you a laminate that tells you about how good their mobile app is, how great their website is. And they probably won't mention anything about their interest rates or anything else. Maybe their credit card. They, they'll mention something yeah. about their credit card. But where I'm going is I believe that Agile is just a response to a new revolution, which is this knowledge revolution where People are asked to either build software, use software, configure software, or interact around software. And Agile is just a more clean way of doing it. So um, sorry for taking this long, but I don't believe Agile is going to keep inventing new things. I just think it's going to become part of the normal way of doing business. Yeah, I wonder, going way back in history, the Egyptian pyramids were obviously built with some form of project management. Mm -hmm. The Mayan pyramids were built with some form of project management. I wonder if they used the same techniques. <laughs> right? It was just the way to get the job done. Correct. And now we've created a profession out of it to help us get better at it. And there's certainly value in it. And then Agile becomes, we've seen water scrum fall. Yes. Right? It, it's the iterations and the connections of how do I deliver work to be able to do it efficiently and get the biggest return at the end of the day. Yes. Um, and I'm with you on, on everything you just stated. So that's great that we're in agreement on that. I love it. You know, you'd mentioned coaching for at-risk youth and some of that, but I, I, you do not just agile coaching, right? You have the seven habits of effective people, right? You do mm -hmm. facilitation and coaching with that as well? Absolutely. So what's, what's interesting about coaching is I didn't even know I was a coach after someone told me that that's what I was doing is Pretty much anyone right now can um, launch a website and call themselves coaches and no one would know better. It's a difficult profession because anyone can declare themselves as a coach. And as long as you have a website, people will believe you. There is more to it. There's actually, um, there's actually real, a real discipline behind being a coach. And we've dabbled, although we've started with agile, um, we've done executive coaching, business coaching. And for me, coaching is just, um, a way to, help people achieve their full potential. So I always joke around that when you hire us, we are not consultants. Consultants actually do work. We as coaches do absolutely nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second. <laughs> Paying you to do nothing. Interesting concept. Co correct. And, and I say it openly to whoever's going to sign that <laughs> statement of work because I need to set expectation. We will do nothing. We need you to do everything because our success as coaches is judged from when we leave. So when we join you, we need to put our exit strategy in place because the only way we know we're successful is when we leave that what we've done with you is sustainable. And the only way to be sustainable is to let the real people who are going to be doing this work do it. So when you ask me about different um, types of coaching, yeah, I mean, it really boils down to if you believe, if you have a hunch that you could do something better, and there's always a better way of doing it, then sometimes you need a coach and maybe visually for our, our listeners, you can look at a, at a, I don't know, a football coach who asks someone who can do 20, 20 pushups to try 22. All a coach does is push you a little bit beyond your comfort zone to see if you can break through and actually achieve even greater results. And that's what we do at, a, at an individual level, at a team level, or at an organization level. I have to remember that you guys don't do anything. Yeah, That's, <laughs> That's an important point, Joel. Please remember that. 
This has been great. So last week when we had uh, Jeremy on, we spent a lot of time on Scrum. This week we're spending a lot of time on Kanban, and I love the difference between the two. Uh, but I'm not the expert in the field. It'd be great to get your perspective on that difference. Yeah, so the difference between the two, and so they're not enemies. And this is, again, when people get purists about fighting, well, should we do Scrum? Should we do Kanban? Ultimately, they're all agile methodologies. They share a lot in common. They both have a backlog. The difference is, is that the back- backlog often in Scrum is a separate artifact. And then there is a, a board to for a team to visualize their sprint. Now, let me break the news to everyone. In Scrum, you are supposed to, once you complete your sprint planning, to visualize all the tasks in your sprint on what we call a task board. I will break the news to everyone. That task board is a Kanban board. (laughs) It is not an interesting one, though, because the columns are imposed, or at least they feel imposed as being to do, in progress, verify, and done, which I think is absolutely sufficient for flowing clear tasks within a sprint. But let's not fool ourselves. It is a Kanban board. So the reason I mentioned that is that Scrum is really meant to lock your work into a time box. And whether it's one to four weeks, ideally it's two weeks. But what you're doing is you're really creating an environment where every two weeks you load yourself up for work for two weeks. And at the end of the two weeks, you run out of work and then look for new work. The difference with Kanban is we don't have the concept of iteration, which means that it is a continuous flow, which means that there's no more time boxing, which scares a lot of leaders because they feel that they don't have the same control on a Kanban team that they have on a Scrum team, which I say is true, but there are metrics in Kanban like throughput and cycle time that will give you back that sense of, well, how are we doing? But the biggest difference is the the time box. We don't believe that uh, Kanban teams need a time box because it's this very lean thinking approach of just-in-time backlog and pull system where we pull the work. As soon as we need work, we pull it in. We don't wait for a time box. We just keep doing it. And this is why Toyota is probably the faster one to market from ideation to actually delivering a car. They are able to flow the work the most efficiently because they have fine-tuned that process of continuous pulling system. The other big difference between Scrum and Kanban is that Scrum, you do have to learn nine things, where in Kanban, you have to learn only five things. Here's the thing. In Scrum, you it is a little bit more heavy, but it's heavy by design. It is a framework, and I love Scrum. We do Scrum all the time. The the thing with Scrum is you do need four events, a sprint planning, a sprint review, a sprint retrospective, and a daily Scrum. Those events are part of the nine cogs of the Scrum framework. In addition to the four events, you need your three roles. There are two new ones called the product owner, the scrum master, and then the team. And then there's two artifacts, the backlog itself and the increment that you produce every sprint. Let me be very clear. To do scrum, you must do all nine because it is a framework. If you remove a cog in the framework, then it doesn't function the same way. So when we coach team to do scrum, they must do nine things, not eight, and definitely not invent a tenth one. (laughs) So, And this we run into all the time. There's the whole... The whole beauty of Scrum and Kanban is that you're laser focused. So in Scrum, just stick to the nine things. Now, be careful. It is disruptive. You'd have two new roles and you have four ceremonies to now conduct. There's also another thing to consider is there is a sweet spot in Scrum. And the early literature on Scrum said it was seven plus minus two people, which if my math is correct, it's five to nine. Yeah. Recently, they've said, well, you can go lower. Yeah, no, you can't. If you go below five, you shouldn't because there's too much overhead and roles and ceremonies in Scrum for less than five people. We're in Kanban and we've done it and we've seen it. You can be a team of one and still be producing as a, as a Kanban team. So there's a few differences. One is the framework itself. It has to be followed in Scrum. And that's the beauty of Scrum. You just do finish and repeat. And you get really good at it over time. We love Scrum. But you have to have the right size team and it has to be a cross-functional team. So a Scrum team is meant for people who can come from different walk of life, different areas of expertise, and help each other solve real complex problems. On the Kanban side, we don't do complex. We can, but our focus is more complicated. So let me explain the two terms really quickly. Mm -hmm. Complex is the stock market. There's too many variable and no causality. Your guess is as good as mine on how to beat the stock market. And the beauty of that is Scrum is perfect for the complex world because it brings people from different walks of life and they're put into what I call a pressure cooker. That time box is a healthy sense of urgency. 
It's a way to put a little bit of stress, healthy stress on teams to say, listen, what if we did it in two weeks? And I love Scrum for that. The only thing is, what if your work is not complex? And so complicated can be defined as building a Ferrari. Once you've built one Ferrari, you can look at it and build a second Ferrari. So in your example earlier of a data warehouse team, so for us, the textbooks example are data warehouse, mainframe, and teams like that, or infrastructure teams. They're not complex. And this is not something mean. It's just the reality of their work. They're complicated. And if you're complicated, then you can, you can follow a process like Kanban where you just repeat through the same columns of your board. The cards just flow naturally through it. Where in Scrum, each card could have very different tasks. And that's why they're very different. So I'm going to leave you with this thought. You need nine, to learn nine things in Scrum and you need to be cross-functional and the work needs to be complex. And there's a team size limitation of five to nine. In Kanban, you can focus on complicated work. You don't have a size limit. Now, I will tell you, I never go into double digit for any Agile team. So nine is the max regardless. But in Kanban, you focus more on one expertise. And this is the key. A data warehouse team has only one expertise, building cubes and reports. That's why they're often more suitable for Kanban because all they have to do is put people with the expertise of doing data warehouse. A web team often doesn't have only one expertise. There's multiple expertise in a web team, and that's why they tend to go more scrum with that approach. I will leave you with this thought. There is also, for the overachiever, Scrumbon, which <laughs> uh, in this case you're allowed to mix because they're both agile technique, but it's really either you started as scrum and got bored and decided to improve your Kanban board to be more meaningful, and now you have a much stronger board for your tasks, or you are a Kanban team and you're stealing too much from Scrum. For example, we always steal the daily Scrum. We believe the daily Scrum is just wonderful, no matter what methodology. But if you keep stealing things from uh, from Scrum, for example, you could also steal the retrospective. We love stealing the retrospective. We just don't do it every two weeks. We might do it every three weeks or every month. Mm -hmm. So Scrum and Kanban are different, but they are both agile. And there are real rhyme and reason around which one to choose. And what we're seeing more and more is that as team mature, they prefer the lighter weight of Kanban than Scrum. But you have to be a good team to do that switch. Yeah, I, I love going into an organization and they tell me that they're a Scrum shop. And I'll ask for who's their Scrum master. And they say, well, we don't have a Scrum master. <laughs> I'll say, well, who's your product owner? Well, we don't have a product owner. I said, well, how are you Scrum? Correct. I don't understand how you... And they said, well, we have Scrum meetings every day. Correct. We'll stand up in the morning. Yeah, yeah. So I said, well, that doesn't mean you're scrum, right? So it's it's great to hear from an expert in the field that you run into these situations as well. Yeah, so in your example, right, they were already um, two out of nine not doing, right? right? So you can't do that. Just remember, scrum is a framework, and it only works if you do all nine. And then giving um, more of a layman's visual of a Kanban board, as you were just talking, what came into my mind is when you're at a fast food restaurant, and your order goes in, and they've got that little monitor behind you, and it's got the different lanes of the orders that just went in and the ones that are done and waiting to be picked up, right? It's a visual Kanban board in restaurants. I love this. So I'm not going to do a plug, but I am because I, I, I love them. They're called Witch Witch, and Witch Witch is actually a Kanban sh store. <laughs> if you've never eaten at Witch Witch, try it because you must write your order on a Kanban card, which is very smart. The bag that they're going to use to put your sandwich in is how you put your order in, which means it's really a Kanban card. They've transformed their sandwich bag to be a Kanban card where you just check off your bread, your lettuce, etc. Then you give literally your Kanban card to the person at the cash register, which saves a lot of time for them because they have all the information, which is one mm -hmm. of the principles in Kanban. You don't start on a Kanban card if you don't have all the information which is where we, we often do a really nice bridge between Waterfall and Kanban because in Kanban, we tend to like to know a lot of the information. How could you build a car at Toyota if you don't know which model or which color of car do you want? You can't start the factory on building that car right. if you don't have those pieces of information. You'd be surprised how often we asked our teams and organization to start working on things that are completely ill-defined. So at which which what's fantastic, it's exactly what you're, you're, <laughs> you're putting on the table, is then the they actually hang your sandwich bag and it moves through the line as your sandwich is being built and when the sandwich is done they put it in the bag which is your bag and you just go so my next blog is going to be about which which and <laughs> because i think they've they've mastered it 
Now, Subway does the same thing. You might not know it, but behind the counter at Subway, there's actually a sticker on that um, metal bar. Mm -hmm. And the reason at Subway, they always ask you the same question at the same point of the experience is because there's a sticker defining, and that's one of the five principles in Kanban, is it's called an explicit agreement. They have defined the best way of doing a sandwich across the line. And the reason they know that it's time to ask you this question is because there's a sticker literally telling them that this is when you ask it. So I love that you're making the connection with restaurants because, yeah, this is definitely how it's it's working. Well, and it's borrowing lean manufacturing principles and eliminating waste, right? All of that coming into play. Correct. Well, we are we started late, but we have run long, and we are now coming up on just about an hour. So the time has flown by as we've gotten to know a little bit more about kanbanzone.com and Dimitri. Is, is there anything you want to share with our listeners of how they can be in touch with you? Any last items about Kanban Zone that you can share? Absolutely. So um, the address is kanbanzone.com. As you've stated, we have a lot of information. I mean, most of our coaches provide resources. So we have videos, presentations, and as you sign up for a free account, we also have our entire team and customer support ready to answer your question. And there's a topic um, on the table that's important. We talk a lot about um, Kanban on a professional level, but there's an entire movement called personal Kanban. And one of my latest blog was about how to be romantic on a Kanban board to uh, manage your relationship. So um, you'll find all these resources on Kanban Zone. Our blog is rich of these uh, topics. And so um, don't hesitate to connect with me directly on LinkedIn or to visit KanbanZone.com. We are um, definitely givers when it comes to uh, information and building templates that we believe can help you. And by the way, the romantic board is a template available <laughs> for any romantic couple who wants to experience Kanban. <laughs> It'd be interesting to move the card across the board. I'm trying to visualize that. <laughs> well, your honey-do list is going to be cards, but also your next vacation and uh, that date night that you forget to plan every week. So, Absolutely. Yes. And also, uh, again, apologies to Laura Bernard, who we couldn't get connected with today for technology reasons. But she is running uh, the PMO Impact Summit, which you can go and get more information on PMOImpactSummit.com. It is a collection of over 35 presentations from top industry experts in the PMO field. Together, we're sharing our knowledge and experience with you. My presentation goes live on Wednesday, September 12th, and the summit starts on Monday. So we're about three and a half days or so away from that summit. Please go out register and check out all the great speakers that we have lined up for that event. Also want to remind everybody that our shows are live the first and third Thursdays each month. Our next show though will actually be on Wednesday uh, the 19th. I'll be flying out of town the 20th so we won't be able to do the show that day. We've got great lineup of guests coming up on our future shows. Reminder also if you can't make our live show these shows are recorded and please subscribe to Project Management Office Hours podcast on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, you name the platform, we're out there. And last time I checked, if you go search Project Management on iHeartRadio, we're the number one podcast. So that's kind of cool. Also, thank you to our sponsors, the PMO Squad. You know, when you're looking for a great steak, you don't go to a buffet, right? You go to your favorite steakhouse. And you know that you're going to get a certain experience from a specialty restaurant. Well, the same goes for project management. Don't head to a firm that offers a buffet of services and project management is just an item on their menu. The PMO squad are project management specialists. Head to us to get expertise in PMO setup and improvement, project management resources, training, project management software selection, and support. And we are 100% project management focused 100% of the time. Also want to remind everybody, don't forget to go out to PMOJoe.com and make a donation to Team Red, White, and Blue. Help me stay number one in the nation supporting that charity and our veterans, more importantly, as I suffer and uh, put my body through 26.2 <laughs> miles of stress on October 28th at the Marine Corps Marathon. So, Dimitri, thank you for being on. This has been super informative. I've loved it. You've been a great guest. Laura, our apologies to you, and we will get you rescheduled. And that's it for now. 
Office hours are closed. Until next time, I'm PMO Joe, and you've been listening to Project Management Office Hours.